What's up, man? Hey, buddy. It's so good to see you. It's been a few minutes. Yeah. Hey, how's Julia? She's good, man. Nice to see you. How are you? We've been crushing too long. It's been quite a few minutes. It's true. It's been way I'm too long. Here. You're here to right. This is where the podcast happens. You're gonna hit, sit here with me and join me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch this. I might, I might jump in. Please, we okay. want you to. All I want to bring your. Well, we'll, we'll talk about line art. We'll talk about you know Tove Janssen's work. Oh shit, man! It's from a classic, uh, a foreign edition of The Hobbit from many decades ago. So they've resurrected everything that he did for that old edition of The Hobbit and put it in a wall calendar. His hashing is out of control. It's cool. Yeah, yeah, so, His you know. hashing is out of control. It's not Gustav Dory, but he does some really nice stuff Tweeting, there. tweeting <laughs> that well, comment. Dory is all woodcutting, of course. At, at Chris underscore Northrop. <laughs> at, well, you're going to have to show up on camera so people can read your lips. And You're going to have to show up on camera, Chris. I'll, I'll be there. I don't have any problem with that. Excellent. We've got there the we tablet go. up, getting so connected to the wireless. We have another tablet. That's right. Are we going to uh, peel this open? No? Uh, well, I think. Uh, well, this is a retail. This is a shelf item. They want to sell this. This is a shelf item. So but, we're not going to uh, open that up. I think people can. Calendars lose their value as soon as you open them. You know that. Really? It's an odd thing. Do they have value? Some, yeah. yeah, my gosh. G go on to eBay and take a look at old Tolkien calendars from the 70s or early 60s that are unopened some of them actually come hand delivered in these detailed cardboard boxes with des outer designs on them uh-huh seriously and I, i'm going you to find find the ones that are sealed and original from like 1970 or 71 or 72 those calendars are worth something on ebay that's for sure tolkien and they're not they're not lord of the rings calendars they're always tolkien calendars any any store you go to barnes and noble amazon anywhere Online or offline, if you're at a brick and mortar store, say say something mistaken at the counter, like I'm looking for Lord of the Rings calendar or Hobbit calendar. That's not what you're going to get. That's not what they make. They make a Tolkien calendar, okay? That is the publisher, the original publisher is Harper Collins. They put out a Tolkien calendar. Other people, like Warner Brothers, they'll put out a separate calendar for their film or for whatever project they have out at the time. But this is fascinating. We've got. We've got a secret weapon in the background, an artist friend of ours. Well, I'm trying. Who's gonna come and join us uh, in a few minutes? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to. I'm trying to tweet this out. People, see, this is what it looks like when people are tweeting. Tweeting, tweeting they, live uh, while they, extemporaneously speaking on a live show. They just while 2.0 is happening. Uh, they look at their I phones. I guess it's all 2.0. But we see the chat room. August Oakenshield mm, just hello joined there. us. Hi, Ravandi. Hello, everybody. Cliff look, Ellen is, Design. Cliff is turning on the Skype. You can always call that? us at the phone number. Scrolling above our heads. 530-64-FRODO. Area code 530. Six. Number six. Number four. For FRODO. F-R-O-D-O. F-R-O-D-O. Now, and looking Frodo at this spell, Tove, name that, uh, don't be the least bit surprised, because in uh, Professor Tolkien's earliest drafts... Bingo. His name was Bingo. That's right. That's right. And we learned that in the earliest drafts. While was... making Ringers, Lord of the Fans. Yes, we did. Now available on yes, did. Uh, all your BitTorrent sites. I'm just kidding. Soon, soon to be available in a surprising number of places. We still have. Uh, we're still reserving the right to you make. You make a, about as much money uh, off of BitTorrent as you did on iTunes, didn't you? We're, which was nothing. We're making a, <laughs> we're we're making a, a a lot happen in the background, and we're almost ready to make a big announcement, make a big press release, and have a big wonderful story. But uh, honestly, uh, not yet. Not time to make the Ringers announcement yet. Uh, I know Carlene Cordova, my director, and my producers, Josh Mandel and Jeff Marcelletta, and uh, Danny. I'm sure that they'll, they'll appreciate the fact. Especially my executive producer, Tom DeSanto. He's the guy who brought you the Transformers and the early Brian Singer X-Men films. Um, sitting down, had a, had a talk on the phone and a meeting with uh, Tom DeSanto. And we yes. have some plans to make before we make a very special announcement about how Ringer's Lord of the Fans... Our documentary 
will actually become available. It's 10 years to the day that uh, Ringers had been picked up by Sony, and Sony Pictures has distributed it worldwide on home video formats and streaming formats, but now the rights have reverted back to us, the original independent filmmakers. So we're talking about a little indie film that came out of nowhere, grassroots support from you guys. The fans on the One Ring.net. The One Ring.net, you know, put out a little uh, shill to Pretty Penny for us to get to travel around to England and, and go to New Zealand. We went to the press junket for the, the Return of the King, and we got the best interviews with the stars while we were part of the press junket, and we just appropriated those tapes put them into our documentary format. So we've got some lovely sit-down talk with, I wonder with if that Elijah happened. Wood, Peter Jackson, Ian McKellen, Viggo Mortensen, everybody talking, uh, just so much love for the project, The Rings Trilogy. So we, we, they were at the height of that energy yeah. when those were actors were at the world's premiere in Wellington, New Zealand. I wonder if uh, uh, so rights ever Ringers, Lord of the fans coming to comic book artists when they create comic book That's characters. a great question. Yes, I don't think there's really any question. other industry where the rights revert back. Literary rights? Literary rights have functions and controls about when it becomes public domain or when rights you know, revert back to a family or an estate. Yeah. Which, as we all know, has been the subject of many a conversation here on the OneRing.net where we're talking about the rights to Tolkien's other books, not just Hobbit and LOTR, but the Silmarillion, uh, the, the great crown jewel, or three jewels of the Silmarils, uh, the great crown jewel of Tolkien's mega histories and mythologies. No rights exist for any filmmaker or other broadcaster to adapt or change or do the Silmarillion. However, not yet. Not yet. Not yet, because the estate says no, no thank you. Which I don't think is a good choice because you want to keep your estate relevant for future generations. And mm -hmm. the way you do that is you keep making more stuff uh, that the population can consume. So I think we should get more Hobbit movies. And we should get Silmarillion uh, TV shows and stuff like that. It's great to see should. everybody in the chat room. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We're here live every Tuesday, 5 p.m. Pacific, from world-famous Meltdown Comics in the heart of Hollywood. This is Geek Central. You know, when Nerdist Better said, believe it. I want to start a geek empire, he came to Meltdown first and said, we got to start it here. And so here we are. Right above the Nerd Melt Theater. This Friday, they have a fantastic gallery opening, a big show, celebrating 150 years of Lewis Carroll's Alice, Alice in Wonderland. Wonderland. Or Do we have a good Alice piece? Through the Looking Glass. Oh, yeah. Oh, let's, take let, a look. Let, Excellent. Let's uh, let, look at the, these awesome little... We have many, many, many artists with many different designs. Yeah, what's that wood one? Crazy. This is Jeff Victor, who does illustration and character design. And we have another piece here. Don't know the name of the artist. This is amazing. Oh, we do. That's Sam King. Painted on wood. Ac Actual log. Acrylic on wood. That's beautiful. Keep your temper. The Caterpillar's conversation with Alice. Oh my gosh. What else do we have? This. You guys come this Friday. The opening party. The opening reception. Prints of this will be available That's for sale. That's extraordinary. I wish I knew that artist's name. It's really lovely. We're here to talk about some great artists. Uh, today. And Meltdown always has the best art shows. They have the best art shows. And this Alice one, I mean, there's it's there's, nuts. there's something like I a know, lot of artists uh, that are in this. There are whispers in the wind that cast and crew from the Tim Burton project, uh, Alice Through the Looking Glass, may come wandering through to see this show. And we just found out that Richard Armitage... Because they're local Thorin down the road working on the film. ...will be in the new Alice movie. No way. I don't Armitage? Know. Armitage Our will boy be. Thorin. Richard Armitage, the Red Dragon himself, will be in the new Alice movie. You've got to be kidding me. I don't, what could Richard Armitage play? What characters in Alice Through the Looking Glass could Thorin Oakenshield play? The I'm, white, the uh, white in Alice Through the Looking Glass, okay? Because we're not talking about In Wonderland. Tim Burton rebooted that, and we've already revisited all of that. Now, Tim Burton and Disney are together redoing Alice Through the, uh, looking, glass. Through the looking Glass. So perhaps he'd play the White King. 
Oh, one of the chess pieces, you know, who has such a strong personality. I, I could, you know, thinking about what Anne Hathaway did with, you know, the White Queen in uh, the last Tim Burton flick, which was hilarious. She was so funny. I really loved everything Anne Hathaway did. Uh, uh, you know, was Kate Blanchett in the last Alice movie? No, it was Helena no. Bonham Carter. No, oh yeah, Kate Blanchett was in Cinderella. She was in. She was the wicked stepmom in Cinderella. She was the wicked stepmom so in Cinderella. So Disney, Disney is keeping its claws into you know Lewis Carroll land as much as they can. So anyway, so Burton. What wouldn't that be a kick in the pants if any of his team come wandering through this art show because they're over here in Burbank shooting on the sound stages at Disney? Yes, that's fantastic. This the rumor very much a green it, screen it, movie. It's not even it's not even a strange thing when you think about Meltdown and the types of events that happen here at Meltdown Comics. Richard Armitage as the Cheshire people Cat. Walk through here. People walk through these doors all the time. We saw Robin Williams come here regularly before he left our, our planet. Mm. He would buy his comic books here and and uh, you know. Don Murphy, our friend who did the Transformers films, he comes walking through every day. Which right now we're, we're I'm having a, a, a little bet, a friendly wager with uh, Meltdown employees of whether yeah. Taylor Swift or <laughs> One Direction will come to Meltdown first. And I'm I'm Team Taylor. I, I I think I think Taylor Swift is more likely to come to Meltdown. I would agree. I and would buy agree. some stuff. I think Taylor Swift would be more likely to come and visit the store with a gaggle of her friends. Um, because she, when she comes to California, and she does sometimes, she comes to Southern California. She has a house here. She has a house here. She likes to go and do things that only locals will do. Like the last time I bumped into Taylor Swift, as like you know an Angelino bumping into someone who's in Angeles, Los mm -hmm. Angeles. It's like you stop at the red light. Oh look, there's Captain Archer from the Enterprise. It's Scott Bakula right there next to you at the red light. It happens every day here in L.A. Trust me. So when did I bump into Taylor Swift? We went up to the old Malibu uh, Creek, Malibu Creek State Park, yes. where they used to film the outdoor scenes for Mash, the TV series, what was supposed to be the the area in South Korea where Mash had their tents, their military tents, and and some of their jeeps and props are still there. Right. There's Taylor Swift and her friends diving into the waterfall and swimming in the pools right there at Malibu Creek State Park. Really? She had just been there the previous day to shoot some footage for a video. Okay. And then she decided she loved the springs and the waterfalls so much, she came back with her friends and all their beach towels and they had a, a lovely time. There was no security, no hassles, just her and some friends had, doing what local Angelinos do. We drive up into the mountains. don't care how yeah, we don't it, care what you do or how we just, famous. Like we like going up to enjoy the anything. creeks and enjoy the waterfalls and the little mountains that we we have our own little rivers. We have our own little miniature shire of our own. You could say here in Southern California, we go up into the lovely San Gabriel Mountains and, and visit the Angeles National Forest. Yes, and not far beyond the high desert plateau where you can find some excellent off-road hiking. And if you go even further east, you get to Joshua Tree National Monument, made famous by none other than the Irish Great Supergroup. U2, because they named their album The Joshua Tree. It was a brilliant album. I don't know where you're going with this. I'm just saying Southern California has so much stuff going on that is, you know, just so beautiful, and, and we enjoy it very much. So Taylor Swift, she's, you know, more likely to behave like a local girl, I think, than One Direction. Mm -hmm. She might think about this comic book store as a destination. And she should, because Meltdown Comics is the grand mecca of all geekdom. In Los Angeles. I don't know. There's a there's a, there's a, a big poster down there with a a, a Viking girl mm -hmm. fighting a monster, and it looks like Taylor Swift. Does it really? She should come autograph it and say, yeah. claim that it's her. Aravandi in the chat room says uh, that she's Team Taylor too. I don't know. I mean, come on. Back in 1985, we were all into Duran Duran. But that's because they exhibited, you know, a certain musicianship beyond what boy bands today have. Who boy bands today don't even write their own songs. They have other mega producers and famous songwriters write tracks for them, and then they just Look, go to the studio. That's nothing new. But back the in the monkeys day, monkeys didn't write their songs. Come no. On. This no, the monkeys new. were a TV project. The they weren't history, a real band. The history of popular they weren't a real music band. is. They were like the banana splits. They weren't a real band. The monkeys. <gasps> The monkeys? Out oh, I got the Beatles. Oh, I don't know. I'm going to Four create, two an, months. A, create an internet flame war with monkeys fans who are probably going to tear me alive if I say. If they're still alive. Uh, come on. I love the monkeys. They were great. They're not on. Uh, but, no monkey fan is on Twitter. Let's be honest. <laughs> but there's a few Banana Splits fans on Twitter. Oh, dear. No. 
Our boy Richard Armitage, you don't even know what role he's going to play. I think it's pretty easy to guess. If he's in Alice Through the Looking Glass, I, would, I really expect he's going to play the White King. That's my best guess. Don't you guys think? Oh, the Cheshire Cat? Sarah thinks it might be the Cheshire Cat. Well, we already had... Um, I don't even know who the banana splits are, but other people in the chair room do, so you yeah, must sure. not be making the old Hanna, that up. Hanna Barbera uh, comedy sketch series with different cartoon bits and you know the, comedy bits. The other big news this week is that we're finally allowed to announce that The Hobbit, Deshley, uh Battle of Five Armies Extended Edition Blu ray DVD is mm -hmm. coming out November 17th. That's the exact date that I said several weeks ago. We've, we've live known this, on this show. forever, yep. but there was, there was this little thing that no blog could publish, actually publish the information until a certain day. So today we can finally publish it. We've got, if you go to the wondering.net, we've got. Uh, all the pictures of the covers and mm -hmm. what we don't have are if there's exclusives per retailer as you know uh, the last uh, couple DVD releases of The Hobbit have been completely botched and the worst experience ever for fans because they, they it was like a disc here, a disc misking over there, yep. a Lego thing here, but it doesn't include a, this certain bonus feature, that version. But like the the the, the DVD releases of the Hobbit movies oh, are yeah. a case study in what not to do. Especially difficult in the face of a dying home video market. Yeah. You'd think that this is the type of effort that they would want to get right the first time so that it wouldn't cause consumers to cross their eyes and go, what? What am I buying? And, and why am I... Is there a different format at a different store? Am I missing something? Yeah. yeah. Consumers were plagued by this by two years it now. Was, it, it, it really was the worst... Uh, DVD release uh, because the, how, the, how the, difficult a time you had making a graphic, a matrix graphic to explain the, fact that the we whole had thing. had to make a matrix graphic. Yes, <laughs> yeah. What they're called infographics, aren't they? These it, days. But the, yes. the fact that you had yes. to have this guide of like so, where to buy. The fact you even had to have one. Like that shouldn't have have to exist. <laughs> and, but, I but, know, right? And, and the thing is, is that the Hobbit movies made a billion dollars each. Uh, there's a fan base that will buy it no matter what. Someone and in a back, just, they, someone in a meeting room said, you know what, since DVD sales are down, the answer is to make a trick of it and get this diversification out into the home video marketplace. Nobody wants that. And then we'll fool people into thinking that this is the one they got to get because it's better than the other one at the other store. You know what? Someone probably thought that was the best way to beat declining sales was to make six or seven versions of the same movie. It's worse. It, it's terrible. I don't agree with that idea, but someone thought of that and that's how they executed the plan in retail stores. And we, the fans, we had to decipher everything from and, the ground and, up. And I feel like the, 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 they the focused on the wrong things in the bonus features. Like, no one cares about the spit the, from, from an unexpected journey. The snot gun? The, 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 the snot cannon? No, the spit. The, 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 the thing that they cook the dwarves on. Oh yes, like turning they, the turning the dwarves. They spend like the twenty actors. or thirty minutes on on a, on, a, on the bonus features on mm -hmm. that spit, and like no one cares about that scene. But the actors were uncomfortable, and they make a lot of jokes and a lot of stuff out of it. Well, you know, dr there the trolls anything. turning them around. I, I was more interested in like how they got all the people to look to get to that point where they. You know, I don't know, like, show the weaving of the beards, you know. Yeah, I didn't see any, like, real close-ups of artists weaving beards, and I love that stuff. Those, Yeah, I like that stuff, too. There well, are people in the chat room that, that, that don't know the monkeys. Uh, the monkeys was a hugely popular band created from a TV show. Uh, I know it, Tina Bomar. I know they were a real band. Like, but you know what? It's just like One Direction because One Direction was created on Britain's Got Talent. Uh, you know, they had all these different singers come up, and during the prelims on Britain's Got Talent, uh, the, the the judge said, "You know what? You guys over here should partner up with you guys over here and form a new band." And you'll probably win this thing. And they won it. Mm -hmm. And then they became the biggest thing in the whole world. Mm -hmm. I mean, they outsold Justin Bieber. I mean, they're just like, One Direction's the biggest thing. Same, same thing happened in the 60s when the Beatles were at their height. A TV executive said, you know what? Let's make a TV show about a fake band. 
Uh, let's let, let, <laughs> let, 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 let's call it an animal name, but change one of the letters, just like the Beatles. Yeah. They changed the Beatles changed an E to the A. And let's give them this floppy hair that was like you know the same haircuts. Yeah. And and then uh, and then they wrote songs for every and, and have it be goofy, offbeat American versions of the Beatles. And right? it was and it was an instant hit. Just One Direction yeah. is as much manufactured as the Monkees were. It was a and, prefab. And the Monkees have lasted the test of time. They're still touring Indian casinos. Yeah, Mickey Dolan's and all those people. Yes, they are. Uh, they are. Yeah. Uh, and they have my my. Uh, I just love the Monkees more than the Beatles. I, I sing their songs more. Um, you know, it, 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 take the last train to Clarksville, and I can't sing anymore, or we'll get a violation from YouTube. But yeah, you know, um, I'll meet you at the station. Hey, hey, with the monkeys, which was the opening theme from their TV show. Yeah, it was light comedy. It was Saturday morning stuff, and you know the the birth of that wonderful Leonard Nimoy number of him doing uh, the Ballad of Bilbo Baggins way back at the time. Well. That was when Leonard Nimoy appeared on a television show that was very much a analogous to The Monkees. It was a Saturday morning kid show with some, you know, hipsters doing some little dun 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 Leonard Nimoy shows up on Malibu U, which was modeled, I guess you could say it was a cheap knockoff of The Monkees, you know, type of, which was... Also, like what the Hanna Barbera cartoons were doing with the, so you know, the it, banana splits. So it's not they had too characters much to in say these big costumes. that the monkeys, uh, the success of the monkeys allowed us uh, the opportunity to get the Ballad of Bilbo Baggins sung by Leonard Nimoy. If the monkeys weren't successful in, on television, That's very we would have never got Leonard Nimoy. Yeah, I don't that. know if Nimoy would have tread into those waters if it hadn't have been for that. Yeah, no. yeah, that's probably so very true. We thank yeah. the Beatles. Uh, we love the Beatles. Thank Leonard Nimoy. Yes, we do. And we miss him. Yes, we do. We miss him. Leonard Nimoy. We certainly do. And we miss Christopher Lee. And we miss Robin Williams. We certainly miss we, them all. You know, we should add we Leonard Nimoy to the uh, tribute thing that we're doing at the uh, Grommens American Cinematheque. We should. In a uh, few weeks. That's going to be an amazing night. What's going on? Well, at the Arrow Theater, keep in mind the American Cinematheque, as an organization, shows its movies and they do revivals of great classic films at the Egyptian, Grauman's Classic Egyptian Theater, a few blocks away on Hollywood, but also at their main art house theater, the Arrow, which is A-E-R-O. Near, near Santa Monica. Right, it's right there in the heart of Santa Monica, yes. At the Arrow Theater, they're going to be doing a special tribute, uh, bona fide tribute to Andrew Lesney and Sir Christopher Lee, and it's a special all day long, all evening long, Marathon of the Lord of the Rings Extended Edition Trilogy of Films. Shut up. They're showing all three Extended Edition yeah. Lord of the Rings all back to back. Only Extended's, yes. That's extendeds. 12 hours. It's the best of the best. 12 yep. hours? Yep. In a theater? Yep. With a bar? Uh, with a snack stand. And, of course, there's a bar next door. They have, they have alcohol there, right? I don't know if they do. At the Arrow? I don't know if they do. I but, don't remember. That's oh, where we interviewed Ralph Bakshi. It is. Oh, my gosh. What a great thing. What a great thing that well, was. Well, you, you know, they asked us uh, to help out with, with having a tribute slideshow that plays on the screen in between uh, movies. And, yes. and it just, you know, in this conversation, I just realized, you know, we, not just Andrew Lesney, not just Christopher Lee, but we should include uh, Leonard Nimoy. Uh, I agree. In that I tribute. agree. And totally have some, maybe, you know, a few moments of that wonderful uh, ballad of Bilbo Baggins. Yes, I would love to have some of that. And, it, and didn't Shadow Facts die last year as well? The horse, the oh, Brago, yeah. the Brago passed, uh, I believe. Right. The horses are gone. The horses are gone. Of course, the it's been are 16 gone. years. And the genius cinematographer who made everything look so beautiful, he's gone. His last movie just came out on DVD. The Water Diviner is Andrew yes. Lesney's last film. It was the Water the, Diviner. The directorial debut. The Water of Diviner. Russell Crowe. Russell, Russell Crowe's direct directing debut. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's got to start sometime. Fascinating. You know. Um, that that's coming up. We're gonna check the date. I'm gonna tell you guys what the date is, because I'm sure everyone is like, when, when, when is this Lord of the Rings trilogy screening? At I the didn't Arrow? say that the monkeys were better than the Beatles. I just know that I prefer the monkeys over the Beatles. In fact, I prefer the Beach Boys and the monkeys over the Beatles. 
And I'm so diehard LA. Like, I th- you're, you're, yeah, you're pro could... doors over, you know, any British band, aren't you? Yes. I gotcha. Okay. People ah. think Leonard Nimoy was British, but no, he's he's an LA original. Another wonderful thing that the American Cinematheque is doing, they're doing 30 years celebration of Studio Ghibli. So you want to see some of the best of Miyazaki's films or his counterpart? Takahata, who is most famous for doing Grave of the Fireflies, and um, a surprise connection to Star Wars now, Takahata's unseen film. The movie that Americans have never seen, unless you're a hardcore otaku and you got a, a, a pirated import DVD somewhere along the line, and you had cracked your DVD player to be region zero, so you could play it. Takahata's film, Only Yesterday, which has never been screened theatrically or released on home video. Now, our wonderful lead actress, Daisy Ridley, from Star Wars The Force Awakens, she just stepped right out of George Lucas' world and went right over to Studiopolis, right over there, this wonderful recording studio up and up the road here, and she recorded the lead voice for Takahata's classic because uh, G-Kids is going to distribute in North America a real theatrical release of Only Yesterday, starring Daisy Ridley, of all things. But huh. yay, American Cinematheque, for doing a 30 years celebration, a big retrospective of all of Studio Ghibli's films. Now, here it is, Lord of the Rings trilogy, a special triple feature. Not a double feature, it's a triple feature. And it's just really exciting. Okay, screening formats, 35 millimeter. Okay, so it looks like that they're really not going to show the extended editions. If they're showing it in 35mm, then they're going to show the original theatrical versions. Really? It is the 10th anniversary of the Fellowship of the Ring. Uh, Oh, you know what? That's... Wow, that's a dead webpage from 2011. Wow. (laughs) That is totally a dead, dead, dead page. Okay, guys, I was looking at a 2011... What do you call that? You call it a cobweb page. Right? That's what they call that. Wah, 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 a saw, cobweb page. I saw what you did there. Well, that's what they call it. That was a page from 2011. That's unbelievable. Okay, Fandango has the tickets already on sale for uh, the American Cinematheque at the Arrow Theater. Their address is 1328 Montana Avenue. That's 1328 Montana Avenue at the Arrow Theater. And uh, Fandango says, please rotate your device. There you go. Speaking of tickets, a lot of people, uh, we're st- we still get tweets saying uh, tickets are not available for the Hobbit extended edition trilogy screenings. They are, in fact, Indeed available. Indeed they are. Yes, they uh, are. A lot of people have been going to the Fathom Events website. No, go to movietickets.com. Uh, check your local theaters. Cinemark, AMC, Regal Cinemas yes. have all signed up. Uh, they're trying to sign up a few more. Um, so Fathom Events will be showing at AMC... Regal and Cinemar Theaters, uh, the Hobbit Extended Edition Trilogy. Three weeks, three nights in October. Tickets are available right now. The sooner it sells out, the sooner they'll add more screenings. That's all we've been asking for. Tweet at the Hobbit movie. Yes. Uh, if you want to see it internationally, uh, just keep reminding them every single day. Remind them to, to, to do this uh, worldwide and do it more than just one night. Yes, I agree. But the sooner it sells out, the sooner screenings will take place. Money talks more than tweets. Yes, it does. I'm trying to find this. That's Where is this? That's just the cold, hard truth of it. So it's pretty exciting someone, that... Someone in Michigan just said they're on sale at the Celebration Theater in Michigan. Yes. Yeah. They're av- they're they're available. There's a whole cheap theater chain. Yes, they are. It's true. They're, they're available nationwide. The Hobbit Extended Edition. So September next month on a Saturday. It's oh, September twelfth, beginning at one p.m. September twelfth, beginning. At- Mar- Mark Mark is confirmed to be a celebrity appearance. Really? Yeah, Mark Rodesky is going to be there live in person. With Executive producer of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And the producer of that really cool series, The Quest, on ABC. Very good. Uh, old time friend of the Wondering.net, Mark Rodesky will be on stage with yours truly. I'm going to be moderating the panel and, uh, and talking to the fans and we're doing this whole thing. Uh, this is all very exciting, isn't it? It's too bad that Sala could not make it. Sala Baker, he's going to... Re- so some of, is that the same weekend as Bilbo's birthday party? E- no, no. It's uh, the Bilbo's birthday picnic is Sunday the 20th. 
This whole thing that we're doing at the Cinema is a Tech week prior on the 12th. September 12th, beginning at 1 p.m. So Saturday, September 12th, Lord of the Rings Extended Edition Trilogy Screening. Yes. Hosted by yep. Mark Ordesky. Hosted by... Featuring hosted by Clifford Broadway, actually. And Mark Ordesky. <laughs> yeah. But Mark Ordesky, he he's going to be able to come and talk to the fans and do live Q and A, live interview with the audience in between the first and second film and the second and third film. Excellent. And special, very special, exclusive video messages have been recorded as part of the tribute for Sir Christopher Lee and uh, Andrew Lesney. And so those artists who cannot make it, like Kate Blanchett and other uh, like A-list stars from Lord of the Rings, if they can't make it, bet your bottom dollar they're going to be uh, recording and providing some kind oh, of a, a, lovely, treat. a lovely tribute recording. So if you guys are in anywhere in Southern California, that's where you want to be on the, the 12th. Arrow Theater, A-E-R-O. The Arrow Theater. Yes, absolutely. The Arrow Theater, Santa Monica, California, Trilogy Screening. Here it is. Tickets are now available. Tickets are available right now. So and, and uh, you could just go to the American Cinematheque website and go to their main calendar. It is Saturday, September 12th, at starting at 1 p.m. Oh, they're going to have a food truck outside. Mm -hmm. They're going to have a beautiful food truck from Woody's Grill and uh, T-shirts T-shirts from the One Ring.net will be on sale. This shirt, because it's so relevant, because there's a new Star Wars coming out. Yes, <gasps> Daisy Ridley with Andy Serkis as the bad guy. And to answer, you hear Andy Serkis's voice in the first Star Wars trailer. Andy Serkis <gasps> is the unrevealed super bad guy across all the larger story arcs in this new Star Wars trilogy. You heard it here from him first. But yeah, look, it says extended edition, all of them. Extended edition. All extended versions. So that's Saturday, September 12th. Tickets are on yep. sale now. And then a week later on Sunday is Bilbo's Birthday Bash. Over 2,500 people have RSVP'd for this amazing free meetup event. It goes all day. Wow. Noon to sundown in Griffith Park. Uh, under our, the big tree. It's our most popular event. Any of you guys anywhere around the country who want to come and join us, there's a public Facebook event page. It's not hidden. It's public. Just type in Baggins Birthday Bash. Those are the three words, and you'll find it. Hosted by the OneRing.net. Yours truly. We'll be there. You'll be there. It's going to be huge. And last year, Sala Baker came by and visited everybody. Yeah, he did. And he was a hoot. He played well, games with the kids. They played lawn we've games. We've got so much. So much going on. Like, we've never had 2,500 people RSVP for Bilbo's birthday bash. <laughs> that it's is going to be. it's going to be really amazing. And it's really, a really potluck amazing. bring brownies of any kind. There's, uh, <laughs> there's so much food. <laughs> Thank you. There's so much food there because people like to bring hobbity amounts of food. Bring and hobbity amounts of there's everything that hobbits people enjoy. People bring stuffed mushrooms and homemade casserole and cheese and chicken and potatoes. Uh, Pints. Roast chicken. The way that... And pot, <laughs> the way that... Or, or, not Orlando, but the way Elijah Wood said it to, to Samwise, you know, in that film. He's like, you never know. In case we're going to have a nice roast chicken or something. You never know. And he's like, roast chicken? <laughs> I love the way Elijah delivers that line. It's brilliant. So, so it's a fantastic day. Baggins Birthday Bash. That's we'll have the shirts there as well. Sunday the 20th with t-shirts on These sale. These are online right now. We just put them back for sale online. The one ring big cartel com or I think the one ring net slash shop. I forget or shop dot the one ring dot. I forget. It's online. You can you can order these now, or you can pick them up at September 12th trilogy screening, or you can pick them up at the Bilbo Birthday Bash, yes, which is going to be crazy, and then. Just two weeks after that, the Hobbit trilogy screenings begin. The extended edition in theaters. But that Tuesday. Those, those are actually three separate days, aren't they? Tuesday, October something. Tuesday, October something, and then Tuesday, October something. Yes. So. No, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I thought it's. I thought it's weeks. Over a separate week? I thought it's separate weeks. I don't know. Really? Go to movietickets.com. You'll be able to see all the dates for. Hobbit Extended Edition. Just search for Hobbit 
Or and you can just go to the up. OneRing.net. We've got the details on our main site, I'm sure. Uh, but it, and, but to order tickets and stuff like that. Okay. Oh, yes. Battle of the Five Armies Extended you know, Edition. You know, I was 17. trying not to get excited. People in the chat room are really excited about Star Wars. I was trying not to get excited. Yes. But I went and, I went and watched Straight Outta Compton uh, this weekend. I heard that was a really good and movie. And I saw it. And, and and the Star Wars trailer came up. Nice. And the, I, the same teaser. And I, I saw it. I saw South. Uh, I saw it in South LA, yeah. uh, which is urban. That's where the riots happened. You know, I wanted to see straight out of Compton, amongst its people. Yeah. And, where the music began, the roots of the music, right and there. And it was an amazing experience. The theater yeah. was packed. Uh, 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 urban theater, but then the Star Wars comes up and the tra- the trailer comes up in the Lucasfilm and then do 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 and the theme yeah. and every single person in that theater was just they went from like you know during the trailers like people just talk on their you know they're on their phones or they're talking to each other yeah. and, you know they're just having a good time Munching Star on popcorn. Wars comes on yeah. silence and respect Really? And then at the end of the mo- at the end of the trailer people are applauding for Star Wars and I was just like it's happening I almost cried at, Star, <laughs> at, at the Star Wars trailer because but it's it's happening. Really, it's happening again. I I felt this the way. Excitement to fandom. I felt this way about a, a, an Very unexpected good. journey. You know, I'm like we're going to Middle Earth again, uh, and and now I'm feeling it about Star Wars and the fact that uh, Kieran Shaw is in it, who is amazing as Frodo Baggins in in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. He was amazing in as as uh, in the Hobbit, an unexpected journey. And, yeah. and Andy Serkis. Kieran Shaw is amazing in uh, in so many Tim Burton films, playing all the Oompa Loompas in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and a lot of other fun things too. Kieran Shaw. Oh, wasn't he also in Ridley Scott's Legend? Yes. Yes, he's been. I think so. He's been in movies for quite, quite you know, Sarah a number of years. Sarah in the chat room mentioned uh, quite a number Firefly, of years. Firefly. The guy from Firefly is going to be in Rogue One. You, you know who else is in Rogue One? Star Wars Rogue One. Who? Hannibal. Richard Armitage. Mads Mikkelsen. Oh, okay, that's cool. Hannibal is my favorite show on television. It was before Richard Armitage joined as the Red Dragon. Uh, but Mads is in it. Um, Interesting. You know what I just found out? What's that? I don't know if they've announced it yet. What? I don't know if anyone knows. What? Firefly is coming back to television. Someone just licensed Firefly. You're kidding. And Joss Whedon's Firefly? Joss Whedon's Firefly is coming back to television. They're going to start by showing the entire old series in order on cable and really and, and if 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 it hits uh audience metrics if enough people watch it yeah they're going to make more episodes so someone has finally made a deal for firefly uh i know what channel it's on i don't know if anyone has announced it yet so i i, I shouldn't i shouldn't say anymore firefly's coming back to television really so serenity the feature film uh out you know, side project from Firefly. Serenity was not the last we've heard of Firefly, huh? Not that least. world. Okay, Joss Whedon on the roll again. On a roll again. And it's it's a, it's a channel that you don't expect. This is going to put this cable network on the map. Okay, so the Hobbit extended edition theatrical release is not week after week after week. So you're not correct. I'm not correct. I'm not correct uh, either. My suggestion was that it was day after consecutive day, but we're both wrong. Strangely enough, interesting, but maybe other theaters and other theater chains might have a different format. But the AMC, which is a major theater chain, AMC theater chain here in California, is going to do Unexpected Journey on Monday, October 5th. Nathan has confirmed that they go... <laughs> He's going to be Nathan Fillion. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's happy to have a job, I'm he, sure. He's a meltdown regular. <laughs> yes, he's, he's a great guy. This is all this is. Yeah. After that Monday for Unexpected Journey, Monday the 5th, Desolation of Smaug would be two days later on Wednesday the 7th. And then I guess after that, um, uh, the extended edition of the Battle of the Five Armies will be a, a little bit later on Tuesday, October 13th. So they're rolling them out like two to four days apart. 
but not week by week and not consecutive days. But that sure is a weird rollout for a, a trilogy. It? It's not a trilogy marathon. It's like no respect. Like, just, they, they, they're releasing the Hobbit Extended Edition trilogy in theaters as bad as they're released the DVDs. Like, they're yeah, just not doing this for out. the fans. It, it feels like a gross cash grab. So something like, weird. you're going to take what we give you on the days that we give it to you. Rather than, like, let's think of the fans. When do they get out of school? Yeah. When, are, when can they take their families? Monday night, Wednesday night, when and then can the they next cos- Tuesday night. cosplay and make an event out of it? You know, no one's going to get off work at 5.30 p.m. and then go, like, get into the cosplay mode to get to a 7 o'clock show. That's not going to happen. Yeah, it's it's not going to happen. It's weird. No, they didn't think this through. Think of the fans. That's you guys, all we wanted at the you one guys, think You guys. Of the you fans. guys. Okay. Hey, speaking of other thinking of the fans, you know, I don't know if we're going to post this on the one ring because we, we don't officially support Kickstarters as much. Mm. You know, it's yeah. just, it, we, we just, at, we don't want to ask too much of the fans. Unless they're moni- our own. Moni- unless it's our own for we our We don't want to ask too much monetarily. We will, you know, like, what, Kickstarter's one thing. T-shirts is like another because you're buying a product and we ship it to you. Yes. Um, guess who's got a new Kickstarter? It just launched today. Let me guess. Weta Workshop. Really? Weta? The artist really? from Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, including Daniel Falconer, oh, he's so fantastic. have launched a brand new Kickstarter. Uh, I don't know if it's on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, but I just got a text that they hit their goal on the first day. Wow, really? Let me see if I can wow, find it. Wow, Weta's got, got some love. we got to find this. Weta, uh, a, new, uh, really? a new thing. So um, a new thing, uh, a, a new kicks the crowdfunding thing. So let me see if I can find. Hey, it. did you get that thing I sent you? Did you get that thing I sent you, Daniel Falcon? That's a little see. joke from Harvey Birdman, attorney at law. Hey, did you get that thing I sent you? You know, Harvey Birdman, what channel was that on? It was on. Oh, it's the book, a third volume of White Cloud Worlds. What is White Cloud Worlds? Well. This is a reference to a series of books. Because I hadn't heard of this. Weta, at the publishing arm of Weta, has released two previous volumes of uh, White Cloud Worlds, where they bring together some of the most impressive fantasy and science fiction artists that they have working in New Zealand. The name of New Zealand in its uh, traditional Maori is Land of the Long White Cloud. So. Aotearoa, which is how it's pronounced in Maori, Aotearoa, Land of the Long White Cloud, is the reference to this book series, White Cloud Worlds, because these are exclusively New Zealand fantasy artists, artists of the fantastique. And this book series, they had volume one and volume two, extraordinarily beautiful, big, glossy coffee table art books. Some of the most beautiful art books featuring strange worlds, the minimum, strange creatures. The minimum pledge is just fa- $50. Fantastic. Like, you can't even give a dollar toward this thing. It's like $50 or nothing. Well, it's a 200-plus page art book, and it's a big, high-gloss, beautiful coffee table book. And I'm telling you, those art books that come from Toshin and these other companies... They're, is, they're not cheap. Just, they're wonderful. This is basically just buying a book. It's not even like kickstarting a book. Like they've already got the artwork. It's already oh, but the people who participate help guarantee that the book can be made, and the people who participate also get these other beautiful perks, Christian. wonderful m- mini prints and lithographs. Some of them have already sold out. The two hundred dollar Christian Pierce art package. Uh huh. The two hundred dollar Ben Wooten art package. Ben Wooten's awesome. He's a great Nick artist. Nick Keller. Uh-huh. Uh four hundred dollar has sold out. It's crazy. Yeah, look at that. Look at this. Look at this. Oh, this. these are beautiful. Yeah, some of the artwork from these folks. If you've never seen Approach to Rivendell yeah. by by oh. Paul Tobin. Yeah. Look at that. Approach to Rivendell. There, I'll hold it for you. That's brilliant. You got it. Paul you gotta, Tobin's brilliant. You got you gotta pull up uh, a white Cloud Worlds on Kickstarter. White Cloud Worlds, which uh, is plural. Hey, worlds. A, a thing from Chappie. Yeah. Oh, those designs. Oh man, I love that stuff that they designed for uh, District Nine, which was also Weta they designs. Got, they got some stuff from from Chappie. Uh, I, Ooh, you know, cool. we're gonna be doing something special. Those those oh, artists wait. are so beautiful. Uh, Look at what they can make. Yolandi. Yeah. She was in Chappie. She's in that yeah. uh, oh, band, a D Antwerp. Yeah. And she was Die in Chappie. She worked directly with Weta Workshop. 
We're doing something special. Yeah. In, cool. In October, uh, we're going to try to get her on the show. But uh, we're doing something special with the Egyptian, with Yolandi. Ooh. Uh, who was in Chappie. Okay, cool. I love Chappie. I love, I love Neil Blomkamp movies. And I love Weta Workshop. Yeah, and I love that these New Zealand filmmakers are all working together. It's such a creative, so this, really this is brilliant what, bunch of people. This is what artists do when they're done with movies. They 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 make beautiful books and 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 well art, this this is a artwork. new thing. What other movie studios or conceptual artists have ever done this before? It's because of the popular reception of their artwork in these Middle Earth films. The reason why these very talented designers and artists have been able to moonlight in this other side career by publishing these really high quality volumes of some of the most exquisite art. Um, not all of it licensed specifically to Warner Brothers versions or New Lines versions of the films, but still Tolkien art and high fantasy abounds and a lot of hard sci-fi in this artwork from these folks. White Cloud Worlds. White Cloud World on Kickstarter. Yep, really, really, really good stuff. Speaking of other great artists, do you remember from way, 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 way back in time? You know, quickly, you know, someone in the chat said, uh, oh, yeah. Tolkien Girl uh, doesn't believe uh, anything I say on Firefly. You know what? Good. Don't believe it. Don't retweet it. Don't let anybody know. But if you see something in the future, a press release announcing something, you can say you heard it here first. Don't believe me. Go ahead. Do you, do you remember the popular Swedish um, children's stories, Moomin, with the big white uh, hippopotamus named Moomin, mm -mm. who has all these children's adventures? You don't remember? Well, the creator and artist uh, who created Moomin back in the uh, 50s and 60s, she was a wonderful, wonderful artist named Tov Jansson. Tov Jansson in Swedish. And she was fantastic. Uh, really, really wonderful. You look at photos of her, and she reminds me uh, 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 very much of uh, um, uh, the famous lesbian painter who did all the flowers out in the desert, O'Keeffe. She, she looks like... Charlotte? Uh, uh, Georgia. Georgia. Georgia O'Keeffe. So Tov Jansson was famous for doing the beautiful black and white illustrations of Alice in Wonderland and what was printed the same year? Back to Alice. Back to Alice in Wonderland? The Hobbit. The, same wait, year. Alice came out the same year as The Hobbit? Excuse me, excuse me, my mistake. The Wizard of Oz and The Hobbit came out the same year. My bad, sorry about that. Um, but close, uh, I think that the Alice in Wonderland was very close in its publication year to The Hobbit. But in 1937, it was The Wizard of Oz and the Hobbit. But anyways, Tove Jansson did these beautiful illustrations for the Swedish and uh, Danish versions, uh, Swedish and Finnish versions of you know what else uh, the Hobbit the in 1961. And she created a dozen really enchanting black and white line drawings, and they were only available for anybody who grew up in Finland or Sweden and grew reading those versions. You know our friend Amelia, Amelia Lindgren mm -hmm. from Stockholm? Yeah. She knows this artwork from Tove Jansson. This is the artwork that she knows. And now, next year's 2016 Tolkien calendar. Getting back to the Tolkien calendar, here it is. All of them recreating the 12 beautiful black and white plates that Tove Jansson did for the Swedish edition. You want to take a look at some really cool artwork? Here you go. Take a look at some of this black and white line art. There's Smaug. Smaug descending over Dale. So the, the, and there's the dwarven instruments where, where, playing the pipes and the, the clarinet and the drums during their evening of making music at the unexpected party. When were these first uh, drawn? 1961. Beautiful, beautiful artwork from Tove Jansson, all available on this 2016 Tolkien wall calendar. I can't believe there's 2016 calendars 2016 already. calendars coming out in September because they do all their sales from September to the end of December, obviously. You obviously um, have to sell it by January. Look at this. Take a look at this. Look at the dwarves lost in Mirkwood. And then look at the way this, these details are done. Where is that in the movie? Hmm? Yeah, where is this? 
in the movie. It's that ha that has artwork. that this has is so traditional in 1961, but it it is so that hash works amazing. Yeah, this is Toto Janssen at her very finest. This is the era of Mary Blair. In fact, that dragon on the front is very Mary is not very not Mary Blair. I'm sorry, Evan Durrell. That dragon on the front. Uh, really reminds me of, of Sleeping Beauty's dragon. Mm -hmm. uh, Sleeping Beauty designed uh, by Evan Earl, who was an amazing, uh, amazing artist. Yeah, look at this. Artist. Lake Town before the dragon, Lake Town after. But this was the, the destruction that of Smaug. That looks like, I, see, I want to go really cool, to that huh? Lake Town. Yeah. I, it, this Lake Town looks better than the one we saw in the movie. Yeah, it's interesting. I huh? really like this, and I th I think this would have gone more well with you think the 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 Lord of the Rings trilogy, the aesthetic of of Rohan and Gondor and mm -hmm. the Kings of Men. Yes, Kingdoms of Men. Like th th there's something about this that like oh of course this would be it, a center. It doesn't of trade. look it doesn't look as ramshackle. It looks like they're built this, up on high 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 because that's what you would do. Because this is what you would do. Show that again. Uh, that's what Lake Town looks like. Lake Town but, before but, it was destroyed. But that's what it would that's what it would look like. The, if you're gonna build in the middle of lake, that's what you're going to build. Uh, and and uh, And here's Lake Town after. That's an amazing looking Being lake destroyed town. Destroyed by the dragon. Beautiful stuff. You know, I was just reading on, on uh, Beautiful stuff. I was just reading about Mexico City. You ever I, been? Mexico City. I've never been. I've always wanted to go. I've always wanted to go. To but uh, uh, Mexico City was originally built huge. on a lake. Uh, and yes. It was the center of trade in that region mm -hmm. for thousands and thousands of years. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it wasn't until the Spaniards came and drained the lake and attacked it. Uh, that, that, that ancient Mexico, uh, I don't know, was it Aztec or something? Anyway. Yes. Mexico City used to be like Lake Town. It was a, a metropolis of giant city of trade built into the middle of a giant lake. And I have to believe, as knowledgeable as uh, Tolkien I, was, I see where you're going with on this. the his, history of, I see of, where you're going of with this. the peoples of, of Earth, that Lake Town must have been partially inspired by Mexico City. Because Mex Mexico City was founded on a lake. In fact, when the Spaniards show up, they said, there's no way that this technologically advanced society lives on a lake. And it did. It was a city of 100,000 people in the middle of a lake. There were there was one, one bridge here, Early one bridge Mexico there. Mexico City on lake. And, and, then, and when the Spaniards came, they drained the lake. Lake Texcoco. Yep. Yep, the history. It's an amazing story. You can look it up on Wikipedia. Just look yeah. up look up the history of Mexico City. Uh, wow! Look, yes, it was on and, a huge lake. And when I when I read this, I thought, you know what? This sounds like Lake wow. Town, a center of trade that deals with other races, just it like does. Lake Town. The men of Lake Town deal with the elves, you know, and they deal with the different. People. It was the Aztec, the capital city of the Aztec Empire. The capital city. Now the Look site of modern day Mexico City, but the Aztec called it Tenochtitlan. Tenochtitlan. Tenochtitlan? Yeah. Yeah. So that CH is a is a hard K sound? Yeah. Tenochtitlan. Wow. Wow. It but does look like Lake Town. It looks like it Lake Town. It really does. And, and if you go into our, our, our early artist depictions of of, of, of Mexico that City, um, that you'll 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 see these pictures and you're like, you know what, this is what Lake Town is. It wasn't There it is. It's the first Google. When you type in T N O, the letters T N O What about Venice? First Google result is Tenochtitlan. I don't think uh, I don't think Ven Venice wasn't as underwater as it is now. And Venice, um, uh, although it was, uh, Venice was fascinating. A source Look at that. of art, but it wasn't a major thing of trade. It was, Venice was kind of a port city, and it supported artists, um, but it wasn't. Lake Town is supposed to be a center of trade. It is, right? Like this, like that, like this. Take a look, guys. Ancient, ancient Aztec city of Tenochtitlan, which I know I'm mispronouncing. Does that or does that not look like the center of trade? A Anonymous. City, a city, an, the apparatus, the infrastructure of a huge city protected by 
the waters of a surrounding lake. Uh, the, the, that that Tolkien calendar Fascinating. is available at Meltdown. We, they just got what three copies of it, and yeah. they just got it in. It's Beautiful. brand new, Beautiful and stuff. it's available here at Meltdown. Yeah. Pick it up. If you're ever in Hollywood, if you're ever in Los Angeles, come to Meltdown. Get this Tolkien calendar. And come visit us on a Tuesday and then jump in and be part of the show. Of course. They don't believe me that people actually buy Tolkien and stuff. And there's no comic books on Tolkien that you can buy now. Not right so, now. Mm -mm. Uh, it, so some, so, some of the chat room of print. says... The, the thing about comic books is they go out of print, and so that's what happened. Yeah, uh, the, the Venetian... Uh, doges were not paid much, so they maintained their trading businesses, much like the master of Lake Town, who thought of trade and toils, cargoes and gold, trade to, and tolls, trade and tolls, cargoes and gold, to which habit he, he owed, owed his, his position. position. Yes, straight from the book. That's very good. Uh, or, or uh, the Neolithic oh, lake yes. villages of Switzerland. I like your train of thought, Anonymous 646. So the that, Neolithic lake villages of Switzerland. I'm sure Tolkien was aware of those in his storytelling more than he would have been aware of Tenochtitlan. You think? Yeah. Uh, yeah, because Oxford... Because he kept his focus mainly on, you know, northern European things. That was his fascination. That was his field of study. Northern European languages Oxford, inspired him. Oxford wasn't sending anybody to, to Mexico. But when he was a kid, he went on a summer you know, hiking tour through Switzerland, where he and uh, some co-hikers almost got leveled in a, in a rock slide. The rock slide that he writes about very specifically in The Hobbit. That was an episode in The Hobbit, in the chapter Out of the Frying Pan, Into the Fire, remember? Yeah. Well, that landslide uh, of rocks and debris was from Tolkien's own first-hand experience when he was a, uh, like, college age uh, or, or younger, uh, perhaps before college, running around, traipsing around, through this, you know, high off-road hike in the Swiss Alps. Nearly lost one of his hiking partners. But um, no stranger to adventure was Tolkien himself. I think it was that Swiss experience that may have gotten him to become aware of those Neolithic lake villages in Switzerland. Okay. Very good point from our live chatters. Um, uh, That's why we love live chatting with you guys during the show. It's fantastic. I'll give you that. But the more I read about it's how... It's Tenok Tenok. Titlan. Tenok Titlan. Tenok Titlan. There you go. Tenok Titlan. So, now I got it. So, uh, what I was trying my, to say my is that is pretty good. if you read about Tenok Titlan, te uh, you'll see that it was a highly advanced society. Uh, yes. The technologies, the way they constructed things, uh, the way that city was built to handle uh -huh. uh, uh, seasonal flooding and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the the mm -hmm. city handled it. It was a large city. Yeah. In fact, the Spaniards were like, "There's some magic here. There's no way that they built <laughs> a city. city in a lake." And that's what I had pictured when, when with Lake Town, uh, you know, a center of trade uh, that that was was purposeful and. Built intentionally, the Lake Town that we saw so in the movies. Never seen, you've never seen any of Tolkien's original watercolor illustrations of Lake Town. No, I haven't. Well, it's just a little Lake Town built on some risen timbers above the lake surface. So, so my imagination. So your imagination was went away with you. Mu mu much yeah. beyond what the yeah. written word. I'll show you. Uh, I'll show you pictures of how Tolkien depicted Lake Town. Yes, it's please kind do. of fascinating the way the professor, who was a very accomplished watercolorist, a great illustrator, and a great artist in his own right, Professor Tolkien has provided but perhaps look at that what is Lake Town. the definitive Tolkien watercolor of Lake Town. Tall walls? I love that Lake Town. It's so awesome. And, and Check it out. Do I find it? So let, let, Did Google find it? Yep. There it is. Professor Tolkien's very own artwork. Show them. Show them. In full color. Isn't this nice? I love this tablet. So Tolkien actually did that. Yep. This is look. Yeah, his initials are on it. All right. Sure. And look, there's his there's his drawing. Hold on, let me get this over here. Okay, guys, and the barrels. See so the barrels on the lake shore. Th th this is what an artist depicted. This is what one artist depicted back in 1961. Tall walls. Th this is stone stone walls. All by Tove Jansson. Okay, that's Tove Jansson, but this was Professor Tolkien's original of Lake Town. 
So it was built on stilts, but it's still a much mightier city than what Peter Jackson uh, uh, showcased. That is a mighty center of trade. Look real closely, folks. And this isn't so far. I mean, it was only built so far off the edge of the lake. You know what I'm saying? Oh, come on. And look, there's all the barrels here, the empty mm, barrels. That The barrels would roll out of the Elven King's uh, forest river, leaving his underground realm. Thranduil would send those empty barrels down to Lake Town. What do you think? That cool, huh? looks like a city I want to play in. See, the, the the thing that we saw in the movie was so ramshackle. It did look run down and ramshackle. You know, uh, this and place looks real clean. That looks like a center of trade. <laughs> and obviously Tolkien yeah. had the skills. Peter of, went for uh, the lived-in look. <laughs> the lived-in look. And I love the fact that 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 that, that, that the dragon, the boats look like dragon. Oh yeah, yeah. see. You know. Like, there's always a hint of, of... Of that dragon culture. Of the dragon culture. As part of and that... It, of the, part it's of their very history. Asian. The, 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 the turrets, the, the corner turrets. Yeah. I mean, y y yeah. Yeah. you have a combination of, of, of Scandinavian um, mm -hmm. cones and, and, and Asian um, tur turreting. But you also get the impression that the entire town was not just down at water level, but was up above... And that the streets were not canals, but the streets were actually streets on a platform level. And that's and what that, this allows for. Like, yeah. Like, and, and that's what Me the Mexico City took knock. But there's, there's, there's an opening knock. there. There's an opening under there for boats to go in. Yeah. So there must have been some intra waterways there. Pretty cool, huh? I love Professor Tolkien's art. That, I love, that's why I feel... His artwork is really lovely. That's why I feel like there's, and whimsical. there's room for more adventures in Middle Earth, whether it's a, a, a Saturday morning cartoon or an animated show like Star Wars Rebels uh, or, you know, Adventures in Lake Town or uh, Silmarillion uh, TV show. There's, there's <laughs> room for more. And I would have loved to see another person's take because uh you know as as we all know the art was rushed on the hobbit for for many reasons yeah but yeah. also look on this reasons. tolkien calendar 2016 tolkien calendar look at that dragon that's so cool that dragon is very reminiscent of evan earl uh yes who uh was the one of the first people that walt disney himself handed off creative control to. Now, Walt Disney, um, in the 50s, he started building Disneyland. Yes. And then he started doing live-action films. Mm -hmm. You know, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, uh, Swiss Family Robinson, mm -hmm. uh, the, all the nature documentaries. Yep. One of the first nature, nature filmmakers. So Walt Disney got distracted. He's like, you know what? I can't do all the animated films myself anymore. You know? So he started handing off uh, Mary Blair... Uh, started doing some stuff, um, some scenes. But Evan Earl uh, mm -hmm. was an artist that he handed off Sleeping Beauty. And that's why Sleeping Beauty is my favorite animated film of all time. Sleeping it's Beauty? Design, really? It's design... Its uh, design is takes, exquisite. It's ex exquisite. The dragon is perfect. The land is perfect. Every yeah. character is perfect. And, yeah. uh, uh, it, and it's so shaped... It, it, it's drawn by shapes and colors. Yes. Oh, and it's very specific design. They worked very hard on that. It was a very expensive, expensive and arduous animation task to create Sleeping Beauty the way that they did, to that level of design. It's taking the best animators in the world and applying someone else's design aesthetic to it. Uh -huh. um, which, which is quite amazing in Sleeping Beauty. Evan Earl, a little bit of trivia. Evan Earl, uh, who... Uh, 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 Isn't that lovely? That's Professor Tolkien's Hobbiton Across the Water. That's beautiful. You've never See? seen this. Have you seen this before? No. This was the cover of the Fellowship of the Ring paperback edition that Ballantine Books published in the uh, uh, 70s. It's so weird that seeing I read. Tolkien's This is Tolkien's vision, vision of, in of, color. In color. But he painted in beautiful, rich watercolors. Yeah. To, before the battery dies on this tablet, I want our audience to take a look at, again, we're talking about Professor Tolkien's watercolor and artistry compared to a lot of other beautiful artists doing very different interpretations. But this is the original author's version yeah. of his own world. Right here. Remember seeing this? Hobbiton. That's Tolkien's hand in color. 
There's Hobbiton C. There's Bag End. See that? And there's is... the three little ho little bag shot row. One, two, three. Samwise and his family lived. And this this is called Hobbiton across the water. You guys remember this? That's amazing. This is the whole piece. I want a poster of that. Yeah, isn't that great? There's the mill. The mill, which became the subject of great effort in the chapter, The Scouring of the Shire. That's the mill on the water, which was the little river that ran through Hobbiton. There it is, Hobbiton. It, the title of this piece is The Hill, Hobbiton Across the Water. That's because that would, that would be Bilbo's address, Hobbiton Across the Water. Huh. <laughs> Isn't that great? That was how you address an envelope to Bag End, The Hill, Hobbiton Across the Water. That's, that's very that's, British. That's how you would address, you know, with a hyphen. Uh, Professor Tolkien's artwork is fantastic. Before we, really but, fantastic. But before we let up on, on, on this dragon, uh, which, which I think remind, reminds me of Evan Earl trivia, Evan Earl uh, created the, um, the, 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 the birthday card, the, the postcard industry. No one else was mm. uh, uh, just sending postcards. Uh, uh, with drawings for your birthday, for Christmas. So he cre he basically created the holiday Christmas card industry himself. He started doing it on his own. He's like he would just send out Christmas cards with his drawn with his own drawings on his own hand, and would send them out to all of his friends and then all of his acquaintances. And then someone said, you know what, you we, you, we should do this more often. So uh, many people attribute the entire greeting card industry to the guy, One guy that designed Sleeping Beauty. How about that? You would have never known. I would never have thought of and, that. And, and, and he could have never predicted that his career would have uh, taken him you know, from, from, from landscape painting, like how am I ever going to make a living off that, to doing an animated cartoon for Walt Disney uh, to uh, to founding, basically creating the greeting card industry. Mm -hmm. And everything I've read about Evan Earl, he really was an early Bakshi. You know, he, he only did one movie at Disney, uh, and then he left. Yep. Uh, uh, they, everyone says he, it, it, you, as you pointed out, it was an expensive movie to make, Sleeping Beauty, yes. because he was a hard person to please. What was his name again? Evan Earl. Um, E Y V I N D E Y V I N D. There he is, I N D E A R L. There it is, Evan Durrell. And 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 so uh, everything I've read about him is, is, is yeah. Is, he did these backgrounds, these pieces. He, he yeah. was he, he was an as exceptional artist and an a, a, an incredible taskmaster. Yes. And everything I've read about him and everything we've heard about Ralph Bakshi, um, he was ahead of his time. Mm -hmm. And he was difficult to work with at that level where you just have to get things out, like to, to get things un, uh, uh, out the door under budget. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to, you know, make compromises. So uh, I see a lot of Evan Durrell in Ralph Bakshi. And it, you know, makes me wonder if, if Bakshi, if, if Evan Durrell could transition and create the greeting card industry, what, what could Bakshi have done if he had focused, uh, if someone had came to him and said, you know what, I think we should focus on this. Anyway. Interesting. Very interesting. It's a, a, quite a fascinating, but that, that this Tolkien hmm. calendar, um, uh, uh, the, these de designs were done in 61. 1961 for the Swedish and Finnish. And so. Foreign editions of The Hobbit. The, the Sleeping Beauty will have had already come out. Yep. Sleeping Beauty would have already been a massive hit uh, uh, by now, so yep. so the Sleeping Beauty and Evan Earl's designs would have most likely inspired uh, this work. Um, mm, maybe I don't know because this is very to Evan to Earl. She was this artist, Tov Janson. She was very very busy writing her own hit series of children's books and illustrating them about the Moomins. And uh, she was yeah, busy, busy. She was prolific writer and artist. She was doing illustrated editions of other children's fantasy books and designing and creating her own. So I don't know. We really don't know how I much time she had to go and like watch Disney films that were brought to Oh, come on. Sweden. Every Everyone get, has a life and, and 
uh, uh, artists are enveloped in the art maybe, world. Maybe they would be. That would be a very interesting thing to see the connection. The connections there. But maybe, indeed. But I do see it. Now you see that generational slant of uh, types of artistry that moves through time. Art movements, art uh, influences that last or linger for a generation or so and then change or fade. Happens a lot. Tim so J. Fontenot just tweeted. They said He says, I'm tired of Justin dishing on Tolkien. Dishing? I, am I am I too negative sometimes? Dishing on Tolkien? I'm I'm negative. I'm too negative. Are you talking about what his artwork? I just I just I I, I don't know what he's specifically referring to in this tweet, but I just come at this from a public, uh, uh, just a regular person perspective. I I haven't read. You, you know, have never represented yourself as a Tolkien fan as hardcore as you are obviously a Star Wars fan. So you have happen to have some more of the innocent bystander That's exactly. about you. Or, or maybe you could call it the cynical bystander. <laughs> I, I prefer know, to call it that. I don't know why. He does have this separate quality I don't where know. he's not always in the same camp but with Ringer fans. Most, it's just the way he is. Most people don't know why they should like anything. They just like, they hear the hype. And they'd be like, you know what? Everyone's everyone's talking about this movie. Uh, there's a lot of commercials. There's a lot of billboards that I drive by on my way to work. Like, uh, I mm. should go check this out. Yeah. And, you know, they don't care about the history of Sting or anything like that. I mean, that's for the fanboys. I approach everything from just the popular popular culture perspective. Like, it's great. That's the <laughs> yes. thing about Tolkien and Peter Jackson's works is that they're great. You don't get to a billion dollars by being bad. And you don't get to the legacy by being a children's book. Like this and, stuff well, is just great, and I, I approach everything from that. From for, from from a newcomer to Tolkien, a, not so essentially anymore. But you've seen all the six Middle Earth films. You have read the Lord of the Rings, but you've not read the Hobbit, right? Shh! Don't tell. Now that you've seen and you Wait. understand. All these pieces, the, the moving parts of Bilbo and Frodo's story, don't you see how any of this Tolkien mythology would have influenced maybe George Lucas's storytelling sensibilities while well, he was crafting it his space it, fantasy? It influenced popular culture. George Lucas was inspired by Valerian, a comic book. Uh, there are many yeah, instances I know those of inspiration. I'm, yeah, yeah. And here's the thing: is that a lot of Tolkien fans subscribe to the same uh, negative affectations that they claim Tolkien subscribed to, which is hate Disney. You know, I don't. Uh, uh, don't turn it into anything I, else. And and but a lot of fans do. The, uh, Tolkien hated Disney, so I hate Disney. Tolkien hated Disney. And, but and, Disney I love Disney. and 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 you know, Tolkien hated the Beatles. But if you go further, just Tolkien, from Tolkien just, hated the counterculture movement. I kind of think the counterculture movement was the fun. Everyone and, and necessary. Look, everyone <laughs> hated the counterculture mo movement. Tried to absorb many things in pop culture. And, Indeed, they did. And anything that got co almost a lot of things that got co-opted by the hippie culture, uh, the makers rejected. Uh, even yeah. the Be even the Beatles. If you watch the documentary on George Harrison uh, that Martin Scorsese did, yeah. George Harrison, in his own words, said, "You know what? All these hippies in San Francisco and uh, and blah 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 were like all about the Beatles and our beards and our, they thought all of our music was drug." So he flew out. He talks about flying out to San Francisco and realizing it's just a bunch of spotty kids that are drugged out of their mind. He's like, "From then on, I vowed never to sing about drugs and highlight the benefits of drugs." You know, and that, that's when he went into the mantra thing, and, yes. it, you, you and know, that's when he went into his Eastern philosophies Eastern and his philosophy. His, but uh, but it, you know, the, the, Tolkien Yogi hated teachings. the hippies. So did the Beatles. So did a lot of things. Tolkien hated Disney. So does Eric Cartman. Because he, <laughs> Tolkien just didn't like Disney's style of artwork. Different strokes for different folks. Also, well, Tolkien... no, 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 no. Professor Tolkien's main objection was not Disney's style of art, but their treatment of mythologies and their treatment of what was essentially 
fairy story, and he wrote an amazing essay, one of the best and still long-standing uh, essays about uh, writing the fantastical worlds. Uh, it's, it's called On Fairy Story by Professor Tolkien. It's an incredible lecture, uh, an essay, and it's, it's been reproduced in many, many paperback paperback books. Uh, it's in the Tolkien Reader, and it's taught in, in schools. As a late 20th century author, Professor Tolkien wrote what is considered like the most solid treatise of the power of secondary worlds and why those narratives work the way they work and why we write them the way we write them to function in that way. And he, he, he speaks about the idiom and, and how you don't go outside of that idiom because then it's no longer fairy story if you do. Believe me, it wasn't. But he also it was the way Disney The way Disney treated, you know, fables and fairy tales and folklore, that was his he, objection, he, he, not the artwork. No, he, he also criticized the genre. He criticized well, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the film the industry. The popularization of that. The, that. Uh, through the medium of film. He 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 objected to just the medium of film that the, these stories are relevant to society and they 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 strengthen people. They, they, he yeah. valid points. I mean, they make people smarter when you read the stories. Yes. And and he thought that movies make people dumb. I'm way oversimplifying this, but he didn't like the film industry. And he definitely didn't like that, that, you know, Disney was getting out. I, I almost sense a, a, a hint of jealousy that Disney was getting all this praise about moving forward this industry, making a full-length animated cartoon into a movie, you know, and everyone's heaping all this praise onto Disney of, like, innovating the in the fantasy space, innovating storytelling into this uh, this genre of film. Now, remind you, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs came out the same within the 12 months as The Hobbit. They were competing for people's dollars. Tolkien's Hobbit, first published, came came out in the same window of time that Walt Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So if That's you, right. If you have family... Late if, 30s. If, yeah, and, and this is depression... 30s yeah right so money is tight you're only gonna take you're only gonna buy your kids one fantasy thing during the holiday season is it gonna be a book or are you gonna take the whole move the whole family to a movie yeah you know and everyone was all about the movie and the experience of like colorful cinema and hearing yes you know and and so and so tolkien objected mm. to the film industry in itself because mm. it was it was biting into the book industry and i think because he had a book about dwarves going on an adventure mm -hmm. and here was disney's snow white and the seven dwarves you know he even put dwarves in the title of the movie you know it wasn't just yes. snow the story of snow white it was snow white and the seven dwarves you know there was definitely head-to-head -head competition mm -hmm. on dwarven thing and so i think there's a there, there's a gut reaction like tolkien hated disney because disney represented that it's like no no tolkien took issue with the in film industry as a whole and it wasn't until the late 60s early 70s where tolkien realized you know what the film industry has matured to the point where they could probably tell my story and that's when he started licensing it 50 years later many years later yes yes but but there is we have letters of Tolkien criticizing the film genre. The, just the act of storytelling through film is 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 negative. And that's what he was reacting to. Professor Tolkien <clears throat> was as as Tina Bomar says in the chat room, and that's very, very true, very astute observation. He was a traditionalist. You could say he was a, a very old fashioned kind of guy. He didn't like French cuisine. He didn't like the nouveau things that were happening to British food. He didn't like the influences of uh, uh, other strange cultures on the seed and the dirt, the soil of what he wanted to just have as his own characteristic English life. That's the way he liked his life. It's the way he was. Yeah. And uh, yes, um, 
<laughs> it's a very good point, Tina. Oh, North Ronner. Thank you, Pete. It's great to see you, Pete. Thank you for coming back to our chat. And you have a wonderful singing voice, man. I just saw you singing on Facebook a few days ago. That was fantastic. Pete has offered the whole entire George Harrison quote. You want to read that? Did you read that? Yes. We went off to hate Ashbury. That's tr that's straight from the yeah. that, that's straight from the documentary. We went off to hate Ashbury. So, I went there expecting it to be a brilliant place with groovy sure, gypsy people making works of art and paintings and carvings and little workshops, but it was full of horrible spotty dropout kids on drugs, and it turned me right off the whole scene. I could only describe it as being like the Bowery back in London. A lot of bums and dropouts, many of them very young kids who dropped acid. That's right. <laughs> it's crazy. Thank you for finding that, Pete. You know, uh, Interesting. Uh, 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 another person in the chat room uh, prefers Harlan Ellison's essay after working for Disney. Look, Harlan Ellison, I love the guy. Been to his house. Met him a few times. Yeah. He can't work anywhere. That guy can't work with anybody. He can't work with anybody. No, that's right. He can't. <laughs> Look, he's just... He's great at what he does. Yeah. But he... The the, the the collaborative world is not for him. That's true. You know, uh, <laughs> and that's what it takes to make a movie. You really yes. have to collaborate. Yeah, you indeed. couldn't have made Ringers on your own. Never. You know, and it, Ringers wouldn't have happened if it was just two of those people making it, mm -hmm. or something, or Tom DeSanto coming. Like it was, it's the combination of everybody coming together, the actors volunteering their time. For in the voiceover booth, yes. you know, yes. it, it's just it, it's it, it it's a collaborative process, and some people just don't function in that environment, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with them. They're just different types of people. Harlan Ellison's one of those people. Can't work with him. Can't work without him. <laughs> that's right. But that's one of the wonderful things we love about Harlan Ellison. He's such a a tough nut to crack, as they say. Um, and I and, and everything we know about Tolkien. He's probably pretty much in the same vein. You know what? I just realized the other day, like I was, I was watching Shadowlands again. Mm. Tol Tolkien in the movie Shadowlands, wonderful portrayal. Uh, Although he's not named Tolkien, he's, he's yeah, a different character. Because the Tolkien estate were threatening to sue. Da -da -da. Yeah. But everything we know about Tolkien, that old stodger Tolkien, <laughs> uh, makes me makes me realize that you know what? Ralph Bakshi, <laughs> Evandurl. Tolkien, they were almost all cut from the same cloth. In I mean, many ways. Just these yeah. hardcore guys that they, they know what they want to make. They're creative guys. No one's going to tell them what to do. It'll, yep. get, it'll be done when it gets done. It'll be and done. Tolkien was definitely one of those guys. Yes, Look, definitely. It'll be done when it gets done. Yes. I'm not giving you anything until then. It'll be done when it gets done. You know, and no one's allowed. <laughs> you know what? And, and and I don't want this to film. You know, I don't care how much money Disney's making on on that dwarf thing. I'm happy with my book. Mm -hmm. and so I really feel like you know, and and Bakshi and Tolkien were cut from the same cloth. This has been a wonderful In discussion. Many ways. It has been about art all started because we just got this in today literally as we walked in we lost chris we wanted to have chris be part of the talk 2016 tolkien official calendar by tove jansen mm, tove jansen 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 uh what <laughs> your uh, swedish is a little rusty dear boy tove that's jansen. why i'm not in sweden so, one, wonderful, wonderful works. We would open it and show you the rest, but then you have no reason to buy it. I remember what the subway says. When, when you're going through Stockholm, I remember what the subway voice says on the train every time you approach another stop. Nesta Karlaplan. Nesta Ostermalm Storg. I remember so many of the street names. I don't know why. I took I took the train so often in Stockholm. I started to learn Swedish by listening to the voices on the train. Nesta Gamlastan, which is Old Town. Old Town Gamlastan, which is the most fantastic place in the beautiful archipelago, or archipelago if you prefer. The archipelago of Stockholm, where we get the great artwork from... Tove Jansson, who was the illustrator of the 1961 version of The Hobbit in Sweden and Finland. Now, the American publishers of The Hobbit, HarperCollins, Who's Brian Sibley? are giving us... Oh, you don't know who Brian Sibley is? Right now, please tell me. Well, we talked to him quite a lot. Brian Sibley is interviewed in Ringer's Lord of the Fans. He's a longtime friend of the One Ring.net. He is a Tolkien scholar who has written many books, and most notably... Lord of the Rings fans know him for writing the companion guidebook to 
Fellowship of the Ring or the Companion <laughs> Guidebook to the Two Towers. They were written by Brian Sibley. Well, he or the Return of the King. Yeah, that Companion Guidebook written by Brian Sibley, he all does by an him. Introduction on the first couple pages of this, and and, and he explains the history of Tove Janssen and and her amazing children's books and her history as a as a you know an author and a creator, and then how you know she was contributing illustrations to other fantasy books at the time. Tolkien was the hottest game in town we in 1961. I want to talk to this man. L Brian Sibley is a wonderful fellow. He showed us all around London when we went to go visit, and he's a great friend, great guy. Cheers to you, Brian Sibley. And, and um, I think we should reach out to Mr. Sibley Absolutely. sometime soon and have him Skype in. But I don't know if he wants to stay up till 1 in the morning. Because we'll, he's in we'll London. From, maybe he comes to L.A. sometime. All right. You we'll guys are out. a lovely audience. Thank you Thank for joining us Thank you for joining us. us. Look for us at DragonCon. The DragonCon app is now up and online. You can get the DragonCon app, the whole Tolkien track schedule. Four actors, including Dino Gorman, yep. will be there. We've got uh, two dance parties, uh, uh, Evening at Bree, and then oh, a yes. 90s Tolkien-themed dance party. It's going to be amazing. Party <laughs> Thranduil. You better show up You'd, with your be there. with your 90s short shorts and and rollerblades um, and your vertical horizontal slat plastic that wasn't frames. 90s that was 2000 that was the aughts that was the aughts the early aughts no I actually had those when I was in, in like in high school in 1987 70s. we did have them yeah anyways 80s Thank you for joining us. So we'll see you, to see you at the extended edition screenings of Lord of the Rings at the Arrow Theater in Santa Monica. Then we'll see you at the Bilbo Baggins Birthday Picking, which is free for all ages. Come on through. Potluck. Look for the public page on Facebook. It's Bag on Facebook. Baggins Birthday Bash. Baggins Birthday Bash. Baggins Birthday Bash. And then we'll see you at Dragon Con. That's Sunday, September 20th for that picnic bash. Okay. And then, yeah. Wait. So Dragon Con's first, and then Lord of the Rings extended edition, and then Baggins Birthday Bash. And then the Hobbit trilogy. Oh, we're going to have a hell of a fall season all through September. It's going to be back to back Lord of the Rings and then Hobbit. And I'm out of money already. It's fantastic. I'm looking forward to it. You guys, wonderful to have you on the show. Follow me on, on Twitter. This is Clifford Broadway, also known as Quick Beam. And you'll find me Quick Beam 2000. That's Q U I C K B E A M. And we will be at New York Comic Con. People in the chat room yes, are asking. We will be. We've got, uh, we'll, we'll probably, we'll hopefully have a booth, uh, but we'll definitely have a panel. Uh, and we're, we'll, we'll, we might have a, a nice meetup and a pint. Oh, that together. would be lovely. That would be lovely. Thank and you for joining us. Follow Justin at Justin's Big Idea. You don't need to do that. Yeah, he's fantastic. But you can get one of our shirts at theonering.bigcartel.com. May the dwarves be with you. We'll see you next week. 5 Thank you, everybody. Pacific Tuesdays. Excellent show. Let's Great to it. have you on the air. Shall we? Shall we sign off? Let's do a proper hat sign off. Give me your hat. Give me your hat. The one that you're not wearing anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our official sign off. Clifford Broadway from theonering.net. Wishing you a fond farewell. I'm quite ready for another adventure. <laughs>